In 1648, a ship arrived in New Haven Harbor. This ship was not timber or iron, rather it was a phantom, a vaporous apparition floating over the water. The story of this ship is the story of early New Haven, and the ship's fate proved to be the fate of the colony itself. Quinnipiac was originally settled in 1638, and was rechristened New Haven in 1640. The original settlers set out from Boston, a city then divided by the Anne Hutchinson trial and beset with rumors of a possible revocation of its colonial charter. The Puritan settlers were led by John Davenport, and they saw their voyage as a biblical exodus and the new colony as their promised land. The party was also led by Theophilus Eaton, a wealthy merchant who sought the deep water harbor on the empty coast between New Amsterdam and Saybrook, part of Connecticut. The ports along Massachusetts Bay had already established trading routes, and Davenport's new Zion would need a sound, unchallenged commercial base to thrive. The voyage into Long Island Sound proved an omen of things to come. An early settler recalls, In our passage thither we were in great danger by a storm which drove us upon a beach of sand, where we lay beating till another tide fetched us off. But God carried us to our port in safety. Once ashore, survival was a struggle, but Davenport proclaimed that their hard work was the work of God, and the colonists persisted. An initial investment of 36,000 pounds sterling helped the colony establish its agriculture and fur trading. The wealth of the colony was apparent in the houses of its founders. Ezra Stiles wrote that Davenport's home had 13 fireplaces. From the original settlement, the colony expanded as ministers led their congregations to outlying towns. Milford and Guilford in 1639, Stamford and Greenwich in 1640, Southhold on Long Island in 1642, and Branford in 1644. In 1645, when the six townships formed the New Haven jurisdiction, its territory stretched from the Hammonasset River to New Amsterdam, interrupted only by Connecticut at Stratford and Norwalk. From the outset, maritime trade was central to the colony's well-being. Shipwrights were so important that they were exempted from military service so that they could work unimpeded by drill. The city was designed to take advantage of river access to the harbor. The biggest proponent of trade in New Haven was a man named George Lamberton. In 1644, Lamberton was the first to suggest to the general court that New Haven construct a long wharf into the harbor to allow ocean-going ships to moor, an idea that would be realized 100 years later. Lamberton's land plot reflected his importance as a merchant in the community. He built one of the first ships in New Haven, and in 1639, commenced trade with Virginia. Over the next five years, New Haven would establish trading links with settlements from Nova Scotia to Barbados. The transatlantic riches eluded the colony. Through his southern trips, Lamberton became aware of the lucrative fur trade conducted by the Dutch and Swedes in the Delaware River Valley. In 1639, he formed the Delaware Corporation to buy land in present-day New Jersey and capitalize on the existing market. With investment from New Haven's patriarchs, Lamberton led 50 families to Salem and established a fort outside Philadelphia. The mission was a complete failure. The Dutch and Swedes allied in 1642 to crush the colony, shutting down its trade and burning the settlement. Lamberton's failure and the outbreak of disease forced the colonists to abandon their outposts. Financially, the failed expedition cost New Haven over 1,000 pounds and brought on an economic depression in an economy that was still based around barter. The answer to the colony's economic woes, Eaton, Lamberton, and others believed, was to build and outfit a ship and send it to England to trade. We know very little about the ship, even her name remains a mystery but what we do know is mostly gathered from town records. A company of New Haven merchants proposed to build her in 1645. The 150-ton hull was constructed in Rhode Island because New Haven lacked sufficient shipyards to take on such a large task. The ship was brought to New Haven and freighted with goods totaling 5,000 pounds, including wheat, West Indies hides, beaver's pelts, iron plate, and a great quantity of wooden plank. The ship sailed in January of 1646 with more than 70 residents aboard, including Lamberton, Thomas Gregson, Nathaniel Turner, and the wife of Stephen Goodyear. So hurried were the colonists to commence the mission that they launched the ship in the dead of winter. James Pierpont wrote, 
The ship was so walty that Master Lamberton often said that she would prove their grave. The ship cut through three miles of ice to reach the open water of the Sound and was gone. Months, then years passed, and yet the colonists received no word of the ship. Then, in June of 1648, after a summer rainstorm, a ship matching that of Lamberton's appeared in the clouds above the harbor. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was fascinated by the event and two centuries later composed the story in verse. When steadily steering landward, a ship was seen below, and they knew it was Lamberton, master who sailed so long ago. On she came with a cloud of canvas right against the wind that blew, until the eye could distinguish the faces of the crew. The hundreds of onlookers that gathered were cheered by Davenport's proclamation. That God had descended. For the quieting of their afflicted spirits, this extraordinary account of his sovereign disposal of those for whom so many fervent prayers were made continually. To this day, no one knows what befell the ship, its passengers, and its precious cargo. The closure this specter provided the weary colony did not relieve its economic woes. The 5,000 pound investment represented one-fifth of the estates of the colony. The effects of the debt and appreciation in the colony can be seen in the wills of its members. James Brewster's estate was valued in 1643 to be 1,000 pounds, but sunk to 600 by 1658. Eaton's estate yielded more than half of its 3,000 pound value during the same time, and Goodyear lost 200 pounds along with his wife. Smaller farmers invested as well. Many of their wills show 20, 30, and even 50 pound investments, a large proportion of their total wealth. The impact was seen elsewhere in the colony. Davenport had sent a number of irreplaceable manuscripts to be published in London, now lost to scholars. Thomas Dunk of Guildford went to court in 1649 to recover two pounds, ten shillings from the estate of Francis Austin, who was lost on the ship. Austin had borrowed the money to purchase a coat and sword so he could properly present himself to his father in London. The debt the colony fell into was intensified by the construction of a schoolhouse, a meeting house, a mill, and defenses to protect against the Pequot Indians. Many of its patriarchs returned to England or succumbed to old age. Samuel Eaton, brother of Theophilus, Robert Newton, and David Yale left New Haven, the latter to Boston where his son Elihu would be born. The final nail in the colony's coffin came in 1660 with the restoration of Charles II to the English throne. The following year, Edward Whalen, William Goff, and John Dixwell, all colonels in Cromwell's army and judges who had condemned Charles I, came to New Haven pursued by royal agents. Boston and Connecticut had turned away the fugitives, but Davenport, a staunch Puritan like Cromwell, welcomed the men. Davenport's influence delayed the colony's proclamation of loyalty to Charles, and so, nearly bankrupt and scorned by the king, New Haven was folded into Connecticut in 1665. The colony lost its religious, governmental, and economic unity, and one can only ask what would have happened had Lamberton's ship safely crossed the ocean. In 1902, Dr. Ernest Baldwin, in a speech entitled, why New Haven is not a state of the Union, wrote, but for certain unfortunate events, it might have reached such an honor and dignity.